when you're buying a reflecting telescope, which is a type of telescope that uses mirrors to gather light rather than straight uh, transparent lenses like magnif magnifying glasses, one of the things that jumps to you when you're looking at those telescopes is the central uh, obstruction here, which is absolutely necessary for reflecting telescopes. Uh, but sometimes we wonder, what is the impact of that central obstruction? Today we're going to look at the impact and we're going to look specifically at the impact that it has on narrowband imaging at very fast focal ratios. Hey guys, Creep the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to talk about the effect of that central obstruction that I have on my Schmidt-Cassegrain reflecting telescope here, our reflector. And the first question is, why do we have that central obstruction? Well, it's very simple. We have a mirror at the very back of the telescope. The mirror gathers, gathers light and focuses it at a point at the front of the telescope. And something needs to be there to capture that focused light. That something can be a camera like I have here with a set of lenses that correct for some uh, aberrations that the mirror introduces. Or we could have another mirror that would uh, send the uh, light to the side, which is what you often see with like Newtonian telescopes, or a mirror that sends the light back to the bottom of the telescope where we can have opened up a hole at the back of the telescope where we can put our eyepiece or our camera. So it's a very simple, why do we have that central obstruction? Now the impact of the central obstruction itself on the light is also when we're talking about broadband, it's fairly intuitive. And if we're talking about broadband imaging, which is imaging all wavelengths of light uh, that the sensor sees at the same time, we're basically having light rays that enter the, the scope that has parallel light rays because they're coming effectively from infinity. And it just so happens that the light rays that hit the camera here, they never get collected into the final image. So we effectively collect less light than a refracting telescope would for the same aperture size, which makes sense. Now, the good thing is, is that we're talking here not about uh, diameters, but surface areas, right? We still have the surface area of that wide band around my central obstruction that collects a huge lot of light. And effectively, actually, in terms of surface area, the surface area of the central obstruction that I have here, despite being a massive central obstruction, you, you'll be hard pressed to find bigger central obstructions in imaging telescopes uh, than this sample, uh, is that the central area of this central obstruction is much smaller than the area of the objective lens around it. So we don't lose that much, although we do lose some. And the smaller the central obstruction is in terms of surface area, uh, the better for that light gathering capability. Uh, there's also stuff related to contrast, especially when using reflecting telescopes visually with planet observation, observation, where you'll see people going for the smallest possible central obstructions to get more details in uh, visual uh, observation. But here I'm just going to talk about like imaging kind of thing. So we see the impact that it has on light gathering ability. But I want to talk about another more insidious impact, which is when you're using narrowband filters with a very fast focal ratio reflecting telescope, which is what I have here. Because as I place the camera in the front with a Starizona um, corrective lens system called Hyperstar here, I'm imaging at a focal ratio of, of f2, which if you're a photographer, you know, is quite fast. Whereas the uh, native focal ratio of that telescope, if I have the camera at the back, is actually f10, which is much slower. And the focal ratio will actually determine the angle of the uh, light rays as they are being sent to the camera sensor after having been gathered by the main mirror. And when you put a filter in the middle, the filter might be sensitive to that angle of light rays. And this is especially true for narrowband filters. Uh, let's go inside and have a deeper look. Okay, so to understand a bit what effect the central obstruction has on very fast systems like uh, my Hyperstar with narrowband filters, one of the best ways uh, to look at it I've seen is from the IDAS specifications for their 12 nanometer bandpass filters, uh, the uh, IDAS NBZ. 
And the focal ratio itself uh, actually determines the uh, maximum incidence angle of the light rays towards a narrowband filter that is placed in those light rays uh, towards, the, towards the camera sensor at the end. And uh, the maximum angle of incidence is very important for narrowband filters because with the way that they're built, when they get light at an incident angle, uh, they get a bandpass shift towards the blue, so uh, blue shift. And IDAS published very complete diagrams um, here of how this affects both their oxygen-3 bandpasses and H-alpha bandpasses. With, uh, in oxygen-3, we have two um, oxygen-3 uh, bandpasses that we want to capture, those two blue lines, and in H-alpha, we have a single one that we want to uh, capture. And what we notice here is that uh, we shift more and more towards the left with the, uh, when the focal ratio decreases, so when the telescope becomes faster and faster. But what's very interesting in here is that we have distinct transmission curves or transmittance curves for an F2 cone, which would be a lens like we see on the left, and an a Raza 8 cone, which is also F2. And we can see the Raza 8 here, the purple line compared to the F2, the blue line, is a bit worse in oxygen 3 and uh, quite much worse, like by maybe 10% uh, transmittance worse in H alpha. And uh, why is that? Because Raza is F2. So why is Raza 8 different than F2? This is because those charts, they show the total uh, transmittance across your objective lens, including the light rays with the steepest angles and the light rays with the angles at 90 degrees of the filter. And when you have a central obstruction, you lose those light rays that the filter can profit from the most because the central obstruction, it blocks the light that would have been perpendicular to the filter. And that's why central obstructions can be very painful to deal with with uh, fast systems. And we can see here the impact that it has. And on the left hand side, you can see those dark regions are effectively the shadows from the central obstruction and uh, how the filter basically cannot profit from those light rays with low incident angles. Another way to look at it is if I have on the left hand side my lens, let's just say it's a lens, right? And we have parallel light rays that enter the lens and then they get uh, focused onto a single, single point on the sensor focal plane here and we have a filter in the in front, that filter will uh, will still have like perpendicular light rays at the center, more or less. But the the more we reach to the outer edge, the more we have those high incidence angles, which are generating this blue shift for narrowband filters in particular. What happens if in the middle of my lens I put a massive central obstruction, like I have on my C6 Hyperstar? Well, this happens, right? The parallel light rays here in the middle are blocked off by that central obstruction. So we're left only with light that already has a significant incidence angle with regards to the filter. So the overall transmittance of the filter, if it's a narrowband filter, is quite bad. And the narrower the bandpass, the worse it is. And there are several strategies to uh, deal with that. Now, the reason that I'm making this video in the first place is because I recently tested multiple narrowband filters on my Hyperstar setup. And the filter that uh, had the most promise to me was the uh, Altair dual band filter, which had very, uh, very narrow band passes of seven nanometers, which normally would be quite bad in terms of band pass shift. But based on the uh, product description on their website, I thought that they would be, this, fil this filter would be absolutely great for my Hyperstar system. So I bought it even though I already had an Optolong L Extreme, which has the same narrow band passes. So I was effectively buying a duplicate of what I already had based on the product specification, because the product specification said that, you know, and this is the page as of uh, November 17th uh, from Bing Cash, 
that uh, we had the like flat top spectral shift compensation, which is a valid strategy to deal with blue shift, which allows use with modern fast optical systems such as F2. And uh, we also had a sentence here that with spectral shift compensation, the Altair line filters can be used with fast optical systems such as the Celestron Raza slash Hyperstar. And so it's based on that that uh, I bought this filter. I also bought this filter based on something else, based on an image that's no longer available on their website, but what, that we can still see here, or actually I have it uh, here, where th these are transmittance uh, diagrams. They, sh they showed a shockingly low amount of blue shift on both oxygen-3 and H-alpha line, like stayed above 85% and including at f2. Now, I assumed that with my central central obstruction, I would get worse results, but I expected the filter to do better than my optolongal extreme, which is not marketed for fast systems. And in the end, the reverse was true. And I believe it's because I have a good sample of the optolongal extreme, because the optolongal extreme, there's a lot of equipment lottery that goes with this filter. I'll have an upcoming video about that. So it's not a perfect filter either. And if you buy it for a fast system, like a hyperstar system, be aware that you may be victim of the equipment lottery, but that's a topic for another video. Now, sometimes between the 17th of November and the 25th of November, um, and possibly after I posted my video with the test of the Altair uh, dual band filter, uh, the Altair website was updated to provide an excellent explanation all of all of the impact of the uh, blue shift as well as central obstruction. So they dropped from the website all mentions of flat top spectral shift compensation or of hyperstar and uh, Rasa kind of uh, compatibility. They can be used and they can give good results because the results that I got in my comparison video were not bad by any means. They just didn't match my L-Extreme or IDAS NBZ in the uh, H-Alpha band pass, which is the only one that I had explicitly tested in that video. And we now have here a great explanation as to uh, how great it will work on lens-based optical systems as fast as F2, because then you can take advantage of the light rays that stay perpendicular to the filter, so they're they let through without um, issue. And they also link to a new, uh, as far as I can tell, new article about the effects of telescope focal ratio on light pollution filter performance. I'll leave links down below because those articles are extremely well written and they also um, you know, contain some of the strat strategies to deal with that blue shift for each of the filters. And it's a very, very good um, article some of the methods we can have to counter this blue shift is to pre-shift uh, the, uh, the filter band pass so that once it's at F2, it actually gets shifted into the right band, like we see here. It would be to use a wide uh, band pass, like uh, IDAS uh, 12 nanometer band pass, or it would be to use a flat top strategy where you have like sharp cutoffs, like almost like a, a step function where you will get the full advantage of your band pass even with some amount of blue shift. So I really liked this um, article. When I first saw those changes on the website, by the way, I felt like I had been cheated and lied to because I really bought this filter, even though I already had an equivalent filter based on the recommendations here. But I contacted Altair about that and they offered to actually refund the filter. I think I'm going to keep it to use it in, in further tests. But Leia, kudos to Altair for really taking care of uh, their clients here. And I don't believe that they knew who I was when I sent that email. I uh, didn't use the name Quiff. So that was really good. And quickly going back to the uh, blue shift the nature of that effect will be uh, to affect H-alpha much more than oxygen-3. So um, I also checked the raw data from Alt Altair dual band filter in oxygen-3 and it did quite well. It didn't do as well as my L-Extreme. Again, I don't know why. I probably have a really good sample of the L-Extreme, but it did uh, like on par with my ad IDAS NBZ at the oxygen-3 band pass. But that's basically all that I wanted to cover in this video. So for narrowband filters, we already knew that fast focal ratios, they're not good because they effectively close off the 
aperture of your telescope to the signal that you want while leaving it open for light pollution. But when you add that up with a central obstruction that suppresses the best light rays and the best incidence angle for your narrowband filters, you really get a double whammy. And this is what happens with uh, my Hyperstar system, because on my C6 with Hyperstar, the central obstruction is really massive in terms of diameter compared to the objective lens uh, diameter. And the, if and the effect would be much less, I believe, on a Raza 8, or even better, like um, an, a C11, or C14, or C9.25, with the the uh, Hyperstar setup. I hope that this was instructive today, uh, that you learned something with that central obstruction, not only closing off some of the light, but closing off the best light. Because yes, there are ranks to light when you're using narrowband filters. Uh, I will also add, I tested my Antlia 5 nanometer uh, filter on my Hyperstar setup, the 5 nanometer Antlia filter, just as expected, did much worse than either my L-Extreme or my Altair dual band filter. So there you have it. Narrower band passes are usually not better unless they're pre-shifted at very high focal ratios. With that, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was useful, you learned something. And uh, if you like this video, feel free to go down below. You may want to consider subscribing. Uh, clicking that bell icon, leaving a like or dislike if that's your jam, leaving comments, etc. And more important than that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.